come into my office, I modeled after uh, the photograph of Einstein's office. <laughs> You've made your office the same as Einstein's? Yes. Oh. And you'll see why. It's not, a, it's not quite as uh, disorderly as Einstein's office. Mm -hmm. I do have, I know generally where to find things, but uh, I have a lot of stuff I need to either throw out or put in the garage. What is your name? David Schwartzman. Oh, are you a life form? I, uh, I assume so. Are you an alien? Uh, yeah. Okay, why do you think you're an alien? Well, because the whole galaxy is full of uh, life forms and uh, you can call them all alien. Oh, everybody's an alien. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know about uh, the earliest, you study the earliest, uh, I guess the earliest Earth, when life got started about four billion years ago or so. Yeah. So what can you tell us about the environment four billion years ago or three billion years ago on Earth, when life got started? Uh, early Earth, the best evidence we have now is that the early Earth was uh, impacted by the residual material that had accreted to form the planets, particularly the terrestrial planets, as well as the influence of the uh, migration, apparently, of Jupiter and Saturn uh, around the solar system. A recent article in Scientific American goes into this. So this apparently induced uh, additional bombardment of the planetary surfaces of those terrestrial planets. Uh, and of course, this, these uh, impacts, which we see, of course, on the moon, the craters on the moon, uh, arguably um, resulted in near sterilizing impacts. That is, the oceans may have been boiled, uh, and while the origin of life might have occurred before, uh, let's say, 4 billion or so, 4.3 billion, um, the survivors, apparently at the root of the phylogenetic trees, are hypothermophiles, although there is a, a, still a debate about that as well. So the, that if we take that as a, uh, an assumption that they are hypothermophiles, then this can be explained as Peter Gogart, I think, first suggested and a few others. Uh, they would be the survivors from the near um, sterilizing impacts. So subsequent to perhaps 3.8 billion years ago or so, um, then conditions became a little better, uh, although Im large impacts occurred since, and there is a record in Archean rocks, apparently. Uh, Archean being um, 2.5 to 3.8 billion years, generally defined. Uh, well, let me try to summarize. So, yeah. so don't you believe that the Earth used to be hot and then it cooled down, and when it cooled down sufficiently, that's when life got started? Yeah, well, as soon as... Uh, well, this was this is the sort of deterministic uh, scenario from the origin of life, and, and I that's what have you subscribe to, to. Yes, and so uh, as soon as there was liquid water, and I subscribe to the most probable scenario being on the uh, the volcanic vents on the seafloor, uh, the what we call the Mike Russell. Uh, scenario and and as modified by Nick Lane and others so but the sea floor yeah. was was it at the there was not a dichotomy between the deep ocean basins and the continental crust as there is today and so the sea floor would have been on the surface wouldn't it no not if there was uh, liquid water on the uh, planet no m much of it would be underwater how much, it would be how the, far underwater like continental shelf underwater or two three kilometers underwater uh, pro well, there are different views on this, but I, uh, uh, water world is one that is, is assumed by Mike Russell. Now you have yeah. a you have a brain. Do you think that makes you better than all other creatures on Earth? A big brain. Better? What do you mean by better? Well, you think that, uh, for example, let's talk about the galactic 
club, the galactic club. Now you think that there are intelligent aliens out there that think that we are not good enough or not smart enough, don't have our poop together enough to join, to fill out a form to join their club. Is that right? I think that's the most plausible explanation for the great silence. So say that, so the most plausible explanation is that they don't think we qualify, and so it's kind of like a college graduate who's applied to a college, university, and they said, we don't want that student in ours, and so we're not going to send them anything. Well, we haven't applied. I, the, uh, the Credentials Committee of the Galactic Club uh, is making an evaluation based on observations of the pathetic state of our pr primitive civilization. So it's an ongoing evaluation. Yes, I believe so. And I, this, again, uh, the, the, the argument for this is that even if there were just one of a few uh, advanced civilizations that emerged uh, billions of years ago in the galaxy, it would take only on the order of 10 million years or so for them to at sublight speeds to uh, send probes, which are called Bracewell probes, to send them throughout the galaxy and uh, station them on virtually every uh, um, planetary system with uh, planets that had uh, propensity for developing life. Now, this galactic club yeah. that you're hypothesizing here, that others have hypothesized, yeah. do you think that's like a local club that's a member of a large organization called the Galactic Cluster Club, the Virgo Cluster, because our gal galaxy belongs to a bigger group called the Virgo Cluster with hundreds and hundreds of galaxies. So do you think there's a cluster club that we might be a peasant or some type of Maybe, we're, maybe our galaxy is not good enough to join the Cluster Club because it's so primitive. Well, that's an interesting speculation I haven't thought about. Uh, but Why do you limit yourself to the galaxy, for example? Well, that, that's a good point. I would think that uh, as we go to larger and larger scales in the universe, it uh, becomes harder to actually establish communication because of the vast distances. But uh, Unless there is a new physics that somehow could, you know, involving wormholes and so on, that you can actually transcend the limits of the speed of light. So in the question, are we alone, you think the answer is no, we're not. Let yeah. me ask you, are we alone? Who, who is we? Oh, okay, let's say that's... King that's, of Sabi. Okay, let's, so who is we? Well, who is we? Well, I In would the question, so, are we alone, who's we? Uh, I would say a... Uh, a planetary civilization of some type, which is able, which is able to, and that of course, that implies like in the Planet of the Apes, yeah, for example, planetary civilization. Yeah, basically. that implies certain degree of social organization, certain uh, uh, degree of mastery of the environment and manipulation of the environment and creation of what uh, Barry Commoner called the technosphere. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's an artificial environment imposed on the natural environment. And I think that that's uh, uh, likely to occur throughout the universe. I, I, on on so, let me stop you. I have a hard time with this distinction between artificial and natural. What do you mean by that? So bird, birds make nests and homes and we call it natural and we make homes, we call it artificial. Is that the idea? Well, it's a degree of, uh, degree of scale. I would say. Degree of scale. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, birds do make nests. But that's uh, very artificial, don't you think? Yeah, well, for them it is, yes. It's artificial. <laughs> no, I don't, you use the word artificial and natural, and I just I have no idea what you mean by that. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, well, you're using it as a basis yeah. of the technosphere, and, you, and so let's, you use I would, those words. Yes, I guess, I'm, I guess I'm using the technosphere in the sense Barry Commoner posed it. It's a, it's a planetary-wide manipulation of the environment. So we've defined to, something that uh, to, only human beings do. Uh, species -specific in, in terms of intentional, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yes. The, by, the life on Earth certainly has modified the global environment yes. in its evolution. But, wouldn't but that why wouldn't you call it an intentional? So oxygen is not a technosphere. No. I see. I, that's, I think, the distinction that's... Uh, uh, that's what I would hold to the distinction. So yeah. the production of oxygen likely still, uh, it's still likely to be, uh, appears to be a, a product of the development of oxygenic photosynthesis and the breakthrough to the atmosphere of 
uh, free oxygen. In this galactic club scenario, I would have thought that there would be some type of rogue scientist who said, hey, this is baloney, not letting them apply. They're, they're just as good as we were, so I'm going to send them a message myself. But uh, you're, that cannot be because we haven't received the message or what? You, you think of the Galactic Club as a monolithic, rule-abiding set of Germans who don't ever violate the <laughs> rules, and therefore that's why, that's why they're monolithically decided not to uh, allow us to be communicated with? Uh, again, that's an interesting possibility, and uh, uh, I would suspect that there is some um, social... Uh, system of regulations uh, that exist in that is commonly um, uh, adhered to and perhaps there are exceptions but I don't think they last very long again uh, the to send the beacon to earth um, on those conditions that you uh, are proposing wouldn't last very long and uh, and would be probably detected by the host civilization. Okay, let, let me. So let that's me. that's it's the reception of such a signal uh, from a rogue resident of an extraterrestrial civilization. I think would be highly improbable, oh. and to certainly to verify that uh, you know, like the wow signal, which now there is a hypothesis that it wasn't that it is indeed not a from a civilization, but Thing from a comet uh, perturbing uh, some perturbing the uh, radio environment. Okay, yeah, yeah. now let's yeah. get back to this question: Are we alone? What does "we" mean in that question? Well, I would again, I say a planetary civilization. And by planetary civilization, you mean something on this Earth that only humans have created? Yes. Okay, so there's a species-specific kind of thing. Yes. So therefore, and we're imagining that this species-specific kind of thing is elsewhere as well. Yes. Okay. Now, how about the word alone? What does the word alone mean in this? Because, uh, you know, we're social beings. I mean, if we were orangutans, we wouldn't care about being alone well, so much. Good. because we'd, But we're social, so we don't like to be alone. You know, if your loneliness says that you sinned, as Leonard Cohen would say, right? Well, we are not... Uh, I would respond in two, two answers. First of all, we are not at the stage where we can expand through the galaxy. Okay. Secondly... Um, so that means we're alone because we uh, cannot go that, there. In that sense, we have not filled the... Uh, if there are no other civilizations, we have not filled the niche uh, that we occupy. Uh, wait, wait, we, we've and, not filled the niche that we've occupied. What's that mean? Well, uh, other, let's say, Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, to be very conservative. But let me go back to your question. The question is... Uh, what does we mean? Wait, what does we mean? And what does so, alone mean? So, exactly. So uh, if we uh, assume, or take the point of view, that there is a roughly deterministic... Uh, pattern of biological evolution on uh, Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, and I'm going to be, you know, conservative there. And of course, there are many other possibilities uh, that people have explored. Then uh, the uh, on a certain subset of these Earth-like planets and around sun-like stars, given appropriate conditions, uh, other civilizations will emerge. So you agree with uh, so you agree with Carl Sagan, you're a brain worshiper, and you think that there are functionally equivalent humans out there in the rest of the universe? Well, I wouldn't necessarily call them humans. They could be... They functionally could be, equivalent humans. Oh, functionally equivalent. Uh, in the sense that um, a brains emerge in a social... Uh, a social setting, and uh, and they uh, you 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 have an emergence of high encephalization in certain animals, and then this leads to, at a certain point to a social organization and to technical civilizations. 
So that's what you think is a universal feature of life evolving in the universe, not just under on appropriate conditions and not on every planet. Uh, for instance, uh, we know from our own Earth history that there have been massive impacts. Uh, at the end of the Permian, uh, something like 90% of life, uh, let's say, of, I think species, of, uh, I, re I don't recall what level of biological organization, but roughly 90% were wiped out. Uh, the end um, Cenozoic, the so-called KT uh, boundary, when um, uh, an asteroid or comp, probably an asteroid hit the Earth. All right, so wait, so you're you going know, past, you're going you through know, the list of things that led to us, but let's be a little bit hypothetical here. Let's but it could we, possibly wipe, uh, it could have terminated uh, the life yeah. at at that point That's on the wouldn't planet. have birds, for example. But yeah, <coughs> but there the, could have been, and then it's so. Well, let me just uh, let me finish my thought here. Uh, so on that particular planet, uh, it may have to start all again, or maybe life would uh, not start again. So that particular planet, let's say five billion year old planet. Uh, may have had life, and then the the possibility of emergence of intelligence was aborted. But I do hold to the view that biologic evolution, in a very coarse sense, is likely to be deterministic, and it's deterministic, or because the because of your communist ideology. Uh, no, that's not, <laughs> that is not the reason. The, re the reason is, and if you want to be provocative about politics, we can talk about <laughs> politics. But uh, the, the reason is that, uh, and I published uh, papers in a book on this subject, and uh, it's that there is a coupling of the natural environment, particularly climate, with life the biological evolution of life and the climate are coupled together through Earth history, at least from roughly three and a half billion years ago. Well, let's, let's, let's pretend so that way, we, no, no, let's, let's have World War III, World War IV, humans wipe ourselves, we wipe ourselves off the planet, and there's still, what other creature would then evolve into this uh, niche that you're talking about, this intelligence niche to build this tech? Would the dolphins do this? Would octopus do this? Would, like, cockroaches? What other species, and how long would it take these other species to become human beings? Um, In the sense of making this technosphere, I think. Yeah, you yeah, so retracted you, you a million saying years, no, human beings, okay. Ten, you mean it in a, in a more... Uh, in a I mean, a human beings in the pejorative yeah. sense. Yeah, the, okay. not, not pejorative, but rather species-specific. I, I don't know. I don't well, know how long it would take. Well, but you believe it's deterministic, but it might take forever. Uh, it, it's hard to say, but judging from our own uh, record of biological evolution, we see that there is multiple species that have reached uh, not the point that we have in terms of globally manipulating the uh, planet. So we're the best at global but, manipulation? Excuse me? So we're the best at global manipulation? Um, let's say intentional and in unintentional. So we're the best intentional manipulation? I think that's strongest. I see. Yeah, in that, in certain sense. So we have free will and they don't. We choose to destroy the planet and they just do it on, without thinking Well, about it. I would say our political economy, which has evolved over uh, human history, has, this structure has uh, resulted in the near extinction of our own planet. Although this is not inevitable and I'm committed to prevent it. Okay, I know you are, but uh, but yeah. let's go back to this question. How long do you, th which species and how long would it take them to produce, uh, I don't know, cameras and telescopes? Which species, well, which, which your favorite that, species? Dolphins, I, uh, I, octopi, fish, frogs? I would, well, I'll answer that. Uh, I think those that live in, the, in water, Per, you know, and maybe... So, so dolphins and octopi. Yeah, probably, and not, even though a, an octopus was observed to escape from the tank and go down a drain back into the ocean, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's a likely lineage to lead to what we're talking about. So what is the so most likely lineage? I perhaps 
uh, if the great apes might. So chimps, uh, bonobos? Yeah, perhaps, because they, we have a common ancestor. So the ones that are most similar to us are the ones that are going to become, fill this intelligence niche. Perhaps, well, I, I'm open to this. It could be social animals like ants? meerkats. How about ants? Um, I, and by the way, uh, as far as, uh, I did a paper with George Mindorf on this in Origins of Life uh, not too long ago, and uh, where we speculated that uh, social um, insects, such as ants that you mentioned, uh, might form um, uh, entities which are conscious. How about chlamydia? Um, I haven't thought about that, but I've thought about uh, social insects. And uh, pe those of you who are watching this, if anyone would, uh, might check out our, that paper because we go into a whole argument there uh, that there could be, again, that's an alternative, um, that's an alternative route to uh, potentially to a technical civilization. Okay, but the time scale? I don't know what the time Take scale is. Million, I don't 10 million, know what 100 the time. million, a billion. It could be short, it could be long. Uh, I, I would say, I, th I think I know where your question is leading to, that, um, you know, the time scale it took to p produce us was four and a half billion years. Depends on what you mean by us. Uh, well, how, our civilization. It could be 13.8. You know, we have the Big Bang to thank for everything. Well, I'm saying since, since I'm referring to the, uh, the emergence the of a, our civilization on our planet once it formed. So this question, are we alone, is it an important question or is it just worthless speculation? I think it is important. It's a very profound question. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a question which bears on philosophy. Uh, for instance, is science simply our subjective experience and an illusion? Or is there a, uh, a commonality of uh, science to the universe, which, which is a result of uh, a fairly common, a fairly common uh, application of certain uh, principle, certain methods of scientific investigation, observation, experimentation, th development of theories, and so on. Uh, this, this, um, this is a very profound question in but philosophy. The, but, but that sounds boringly rational and abstract to the man in the streets. And uh, so uh, surely there are people who don't care about this question, and you've talked to them. Are their lives well, not but, worth living because they're unexamined? I think that most people have what, quote, common sense materialism. They know if they cross the street and in front of a car, they can be killed. And so consciousness, they understand that they, their own um, being could be terminated and then their relatives would hopefully do a good funeral for them. So they believe that there is an external world outside of their consciousness. Uh, this is common sense materialism. Of course, once you go through philosophy um, uh, program at certain universities, then you, there are philosophers that posit that this is all illusion, that uh, the world is really a product of our consciousness. Although they will not dare cross the street uh, with a lot of traffic. So, uh, so these are questions, very fundamental questions that are common through humanity. But wait, but you've taught a lot of people at Howard University. Not many of these students were interested in this question. If you talk to a student who's very bored and would rather listen to music or rather go to a party and have, you know, try to find a boyfriend or girlfriend, what do you do with somebody like that and say, hey, this is more important than you uh, getting married or something? I'm not sure. How do, you, how do you address bored, apathetic, more irrational undergraduates? <laughs> Uh, I have to uh, concede that was a challenge for some students, although I did succeed in my classes on this subject, which I did teach, extraterrestrial life. I taught, uh, well, different names, exobiology and so on, for several decades, by the way. I taught at Howard University for 39 years, and I 
then I developed these courses, which were very, uh, matter of fact, Lee J. Rickett attend, sat in one of my lectures, and we collaborated on that American Science this paper in 1988. So in terms of the, what you're asking, how do you motivate a, a student to be, uh, let's say, be excited about this question? And well, that's what, and that is, uh, it, it's a challenge, but I would submit that the th the connection that might actually lead to this excitement is actually a, a, a realization which may, a lot of millennials um, actually are um, committed to now, uh, for instance, the climate justice movement. So... Uh, they are concerned about what is happening in their future. And uh, so this cosmic questions that you're asking, I think are very relevant to the future of our own civilization. So, so what do you think will be the future of, our, of humans? Uh, like in 10 uh, years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, a million years, 10 million years? I think we're at a great bifurcation in human history. Uh, and we have not much time left, and I don't think we don't have much time left in this interview either. So uh, the the uh, the ever rising uh, uh, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in particular, uh, are leading us to tipping points to catastrophic climate change. And, How soon will this come? Uh, Two well, years? Is that ten years? Or two hundred uh, years? The, the, the studies that I'm aware of uh, point to the necessity, the imperative of leveling off and rapidly curbing carbon emissions within probably a decade. So if I were a young, if, decade. if I were an undergraduate student, I should say to hell with this are we alone question. I should be concerned with climate, climate warming, global climate warming change. Well, I, again, you know, your um, it, it, that question is actually, in a way, disrespecting uh, this the the millennial because you're 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 creating an image of the millennial of this young person um, that is so narrowly focused on one thing, and they're not open to seeing this in a broader context. And I think it is precisely a commitment to changing the world that opens up a, uh, let's say, a, uh, a feeling and, and a, uh, um, a commitment to um, thinking broadly, more broadly about these kind of questions because this is a global issue. And so I think it open, in order to really be informed about what is involved in preventing catastrophic climate change and nuclear war, the two are actually connected together because the obstacle I have argued in my papers and so on and talks, the chief obstacle is the military-industrial complex, which Eisenhower identified uh, 50 years ago, but now it's morphed into a complex where you can add a few other uh, adjectives, that is military, industrial, fossil fuel, nuclear, state terror, and surveillance complex, which is blocking a number of things. It's blocking the the, the transfer of resources from military spending, which is nearly two trillion a year, to, re to preventing c catastrophic climate change. And that is, that would involve uh, the uh, building a new in energy infrastructure based on wind and solar energy that would end energy poverty for most that is experienced by most people in the world. Could all of this be due to some uh, alien who doesn't want us to join the Galactic Club and they're undermining our credentials by planting silly ideas like the military industrial complex into our government bodies? Uh, why don't you write a science fiction <laughs> book about that? I think it's uh, rather from our own uh, 
uh, development of our political economy on our planet, particularly okay. in the stage it is now, late capitalism. Okay, and so we're we headed for post-capitalism. And how, what this post-capitalism will be is very, hardly contingent on what, the activities of uh, mass movements all over the world. And it could be plunging us back to a, a much more uh, disorganized and miserable state than even exists now or to a new civilization, global civilization, that could actually uh, uh, earn us the, um, the um, credentials the to, to, allow to, us to, join. That allow, to join the Galactic Club. All right, now there are three types of aliens. There, I've been watching movies and they say there are sexy aliens in which you can have sex with. There are the enemy aliens that are going to kill you. And then there are the academics aliens and they're the ones who know everything and they're going to teach us how to get along with each other. Which do you think uh, would you like? Let's talk, forget about your rational side, but let's just talk about your emotional side. Which one of those three aliens or another type would you like to uh, encounter? Yeah. Which the sexy aliens, the evil aliens that are going to kill you, or the ones that are going to answer all your questions? And I guess they're communists. Are you are you uh, pos are you proposing that uh, I can enter, let's say, in virtual reality with the? No, no, I'm asking side? you about your emotional side. So forget your rational <laughs> side of your brain. Just ask emotionally, David Schwartzman. Emotionally, what type of aliens would he like to encounter? Well, I would like to encounter the most probable type, which is. Uh, the those who survive the uh, bifurcation we're facing now mm. and actually develop into an advanced uh, civilization, as Carl Sagan and I think Newman suggest, proposed in their paper quite a few years ago, that there is kind of a filter which prevents self-destructive civilizations from uh, becoming, uh, from... Uh, you know, uh, surviving and then developing into a more mature one, uh, worthy of the uh, credentials of the Galactic Club. Okay, so uh, are we alone? Uh, this obviously is a, uh, a real answer to this uh, can only be the product of further investigation, of further observation, uh, through the through the uh, practices of um, which many in the SETI field have proposed, uh, radio telescopes looking for artifacts of extraterrestrial civilizations in our own planet, in the solar system, etc. But um, uh, the um, uh, the I think the answer will come about through our own practice to actually make uh, our own civilization a mature civilization. Now, at the, you've seen the movie Contact, I guess, with uh, Jodie Foster playing the role of Jill Tarter, and she listens, and she hears the aliens, and they build a spaceship, and then they go... Have you seen this movie? Yeah. Okay. I read the novel, too. Okay, good. I haven't read the novel. I just bought it. Uh, but at the end, some child says, are we alone to her? And she says the answer... Well, if we are alone, that would be an awful waste of space. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Uh, that kind of uh, that kind of implies some uh, uh, cosmic intelligence that's looking over us. So I'm not a I'm not uh, a believer in that. So if we are alone, it's not a waste of space. Huh? Well, who's to judge? I guess you are. Uh, I'm asking you. This is an interview of you. Uh, well, I would. Uh, way, there's too many um, subtexts in that question for me to answer. Waste by, if you're asking me whether um, I would welcome the fact that the verification of a galactic club, yes, I would. Because emotionally, uh, then we're part of a much bigger uh, community, now when, eventually. When the Europeans so, went to Australia, they called it Terra Nullis because they didn't see any other Europeans there. All they saw was Aborigines. So they said, what a waste of space this is. That's yeah. kind of what I, that's my opinion of what that statement. So in other words, I disapprove heartily of it because it says, hey, if, if they're like us, then it's not a waste of space. But if there's not like us, then it's Terra Nullis. Oh, well, I certainly, if, if the rest of the galaxy, we're just talking about our own Milky Way now, if the 
the rest of the galaxy is not populated by extraterrestrial civilization for some reason, and we are, we are alone, at least temporarily alone, uh, then uh, this would still be a very interesting place to uh, investigate ultimately uh, for to see the factors that would actually uh, abort such a development and also to uh, explore the galaxy for different life forms. And so our other lives forms. would not be meaningless if there were no, no galactic well, club. No, of course not. But we'd be filling out this application form in vain because there's no university to apply to. Indeed, but, uh, that, but the, the observational program to do it, I'm sure, will also come up with some very important other discoveries about our universe. So it isn't certainly a waste. Uh, and even a negative result, ultimately, will teach us something about our own uh, civilization and perhaps even lead to uh, a more respect for the need to survive and get over the problems that we are facing now in our own civilization. But I suspect that uh, we don't have much time left in this bifurcation, and uh, we won't get to that point to actually unfold a systematic uh, search. And I would refer to anyone listening to that to go to my essay on Astrobiology magazine, where I go into the, these different scenarios. And actually, I have a a critique of your own views on uh, intelligent emergence of intelligence, and that was in 2010. Okay, so any last words of wisdom or advice to these young students who are being exposed to this question, are we alone for the first time? I would, I would say, uh, I would say that you, uh, and what I'm about to say is not new, and these students are now being faced with a responsibility to prevent climate catastrophe. And, uh, I, and many of them are taking on this responsibility and not simply uh, uh, avoiding it and you know, uh, getting into activities to avoid addressing it because it's too formidable. But my final words are this, you have a unique opportunity in the history of our civilization to create a much better world, the, what we've called the, better, the other world that's possible. And uh, look into the results of the World Social Forum coming up in August in Montreal. This is a network of people all over the world that are engaged in this activity for the common interests of humanity. And you have a, ch you have a ch uh, opportunity to engage in this very exciting project so and let be me, part let me, of it. Let me summarize what you're saying. You're saying the best way to find extraterrestrials is to survive and keep listening. I would say the, be the best way, as, as I argued in the essay that I mentioned, is to change the world and make it possible for us to emerge as a mature civilization. So ending war, poverty, and uh, making realizing the full potential of even the technologies we have now, particularly information technology and renewable energy technologies. Let's suppose that there's World War III, four and five, and we kill ourselves. And if there is such a thing as an intelligence niche, how long will it, which critter do you think is most likely to evolve into this niche and how long will it take? Well, let's assume that this uh, nuclear war leaves biodiversity pretty much the same as it is today, which is kind of unreasonable to assume. But you, you're making a thought experiment. We wipe out, let's say a, a better scenario I think would be some kind of pandemic which wipes out everyone but doesn't affect anything else. Okay, let's start from that timeline. So uh, we would have uh, big brain mammals on the planet. We'd have the great apes. Uh, we'd have corvid birds. Mm -hmm. We'd have dolphins. Octopi, if, dolphins. Yes. Yeah. Now, just for terrestrial uh, 
terrestrial animals. We're talking about techno civilization, right? Yes. How long before we get a camera? I would I would say uh, less than ten million years. Less and than the 10. reason the reason is that I've made an argument for cooling, climatic cooling being a primary lease of for encephalization. And that's just based on a, on simple physics that uh, for a big brained animal uh, let's say terrestrial animals, so the heat conduction is not certainly as efficient as in the water. Uh, you, the temperature differential between the ambient environment and the brain, which is very energy intensive, uh, will uh, determine, uh, will be a, a, a very important factor in terms of how big a brain could be at a certain time. And uh, uh, and so with a cooling uh, climate, the brain would cool more efficiently. So that's what I, what I argued with George Middendorf and other people, that this cooling is a primary lease. And we see in the Cenozoic as well that uh, the, you have the late Cenozoic, we see the emergence of a whole bunch of big brain animals. We see a, a burst in civilization. So if the, uh, now, the, if we look at the long-term climate history of the Earth, uh, this window for encephalization has approximately existed for about 500 million years. Uh, and so I, of course, I wouldn't argue that this is automatically, in a, 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 as soon as the temperature cools down sufficiently, you automatically get uh, filling that niche, niche with uh, big brain animals, uh, but uh, there were other probably prerequisites in evolution to reach that stage. So that's basically the argument. I would, uh, uh, I certainly would, uh, it would be horrible to actually make that experiment. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But that's what I would predict. And again, the test ultimately uh, will be our exploration of the galaxy and uh, perhaps beginning with actual communication with extraterrestrial intelligence uh, once we are admitted as members of the Galactic Club. And then we can uh, share our uh, knowledge with probably millions of other uh, civilizations in the galaxy and then we can make the test. I don't think the test will be made by actual uh, physical space flight to uh, other uh, planetary civilizations. Uh, I think it would be made much more likely from actual communication. And so uh, Eskimos have bigger brains than we have? Um, actually, I think there's some data to indicate that. Yeah, actually, uh, modestly. And Neanderthals got bigger brains because they moved north? Uh, I'm not sure about that, but they did have, I think, a higher encephalization quotient than Homo sapiens. Okay. Well, thank you very much for Any your... more questions, Professor? Well, I have lots and lots of more questions. But... <laughs> well, why don't you use the time for... A okay, I'll ask you again. Are we a alone? A couple of it. Are we alone? Yeah. Are we alone? Yes, are we alone? Oh, it's, it's only you and me in the kitchen. Well, then we are alone. <laughs> are we? I don't. Okay. Finally, I would just say that uh, I certainly don't. If I, if my position is we're not alone, but again, obviously, I can't prove this. But that's my uh, judgment based on uh, science, the the cutting edge of science as we know it. And of course, this is the subtext for the astrobiology research program, the search for life in the universe. If, if you started out by assuming that we're alone, they, why bother even doing it? So, uh, and so... I thought you'd like null result. Well, a null, the null result I was referring to in some of my papers, like the one in American Scientists with Lee J. Rickard, uh, was just to test the, um, uh, to search for ourselves in the galaxy. And what I mean by that is simply leakage radiation 
uh, at the level that the our technosphere is emitting. And mo the most powerful signal, by the way, I understand is military radar now. So uh, we argued that the earlier terms in the Drake equation, of course, are being filled in. We have a much better knowledge of that than in 19, uh, when did I write that paper? 1988. Uh, we know the fraction, uh, we're much closer in understanding the fraction of uh, uh, stars that have planets and so forth. Uh, so the, the, uh, the um, early terms in the Drake equation are getting filled in progressively, but of course L, the lifetime, is we have no idea what that is. So we argued that if we build a big enough telescope in space to actually be capable of detecting this leakage radiation through the galaxy, then we could uh, s set a limit to N, the number of technical civilizations, over the lifetime or the rate of emergence of technical civilizations like ourselves. And so uh, I think that argument uh, is still valid. And, and in order, and of course, what, what I've further argued in my Astrobiology magazine uh, article in 2010 was that I think, thinking through some scenarios, um, perhaps a galactic club uh, is uh, sending us a beacon. They already know we're here by surveillance probes, Bracewell, Bracewell probes that may be in the, like the asteroid belt. We touched on that earlier. Well, how do you know we're not inside of an alien? Well, let me just finish this thought. So uh, if we actually mobilize enough resources to build this a radio telescope, it's uh, depending on the cost, the cost may be going down, but it's on the order of trillions of dollars, uh, least equal to an, the annual military expenditures, which is close to two trillion. Uh, if this, if this such a telescope were built, uh, certainly there are other priorities that have to be addressed first. So if we are prepared as a a global civilization to build this telescope, that would be really a signal, uh, a sign that we have become a mature civilization. Because we know how to waste money? Yeah, because we uh, know how to mobilize our resources first to solve the basic problems that are facing us. And so we have the capability to do that. And then maybe the Galactic Club is actually sending a, a very weak beacon that we would pick up in such a telescope. Or, alternatively, they may, at that point, being uh, if we're on, under surveillance in our own solar system, they may uh, establish contact just from uh, observing our planet and seeing that big telescope and orbiting. <laughs> well, you, the, guys, you guys deserve to be in the Galactic Club. <laughs> so how come, well, the question is... So the question is, uh, do, do you think we're inside of an alien? Do you think we're part of an alien? Um... I'm not sure what you're getting at there, uh, Charlie. The are we inside of an alien? You know, like for example, you have a, about 100, 100 billion cells in your brain. And maybe those, I don't think any one of them knows that they're inside your brain. So maybe we're inside of an alien. We don't know it. In the same sense that your, a neuron inside your brain does not know it's part of your brain. Well, what, what would be a uh, observational uh, criteria for that? How, well, how we, could your uh, neuron figure out it's in your brain? Well, the neurons themselves are not conscious. Consciousness is from the collective activity of our brain. Oh, David. Oh, David? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, uh, what, you know, they, these kind of questions <coughs> are, again, okay. uh, interesting to examine from science fiction. But I would, I would submit that the, uh, the test of these f more philosophical questions or uh, we're not even talking you about all we are a simulation of some gigantic intelligence in the meta. Yes. meta are we, are we a part of a simulation? I don't, I don't know. Does it How would we test it? 
You look for a glitch, just like in the Matrix. Well, that I uh, I urge that you uh, get on to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about uh, nano aliens? Do you think there are nano aliens all around us? That's an interesting idea. You can test it's it. With, a, you can test an, it with advanced, uh, an advanced civilization. I know there have been suggestions that uh, there are signals that the extraterrestrial is actually embedded in our DNA. Yeah. Yeah, there have been papers like that. Yeah. You know. Yeah, there have been other dead ends, though. For instance, uh, I think it was Crick and... Uh, Crick and... Uh, no, it was, it was Frederick Crick and... Or Gale that wrote a paper that suggested that uh, we are result of panspermia, directed panspermia, that some... Why is, uh, it, why is it called trans, transpermia? Why is it called yeah. trans uh, egg -ia? Well, I don't know, but... Because that's sperm, you know, it's not, well, it's, it's, well it's maybe a it's sperm. a male sperm can't chauvinist... Do it's it's got to uh, fertilize something, right? It's a male chauvinist uh, point of view. So why don't okay. you change the word? You know, you're a socially well, conscious kind of guy. All right, well, Pan you're, egg -ia. Getting, you're getting into semantics. The meaning of the word is that either life came from, let's say, uh, some bacterial spore in a meteorite and land on Earth, like we're Martians. So it should be or landing here now. it's directed, yeah. So or it's directed uh, from some, what they suggested, that actually a spaceship landed on Earth very early in Earth history. And, uh, well, the, the, the humorous version is they got outside and they had a picnic and some crumbs were left. And these bacteria then were the uh, the last uh, Luca, the the universal ancestor of all life, and and why they suggested this is because molybdenum happens to be a rare element that is very important in certain enzymes like nitrogenase and so on. So, but it turned out that this kind of hypothesis it was interesting, but it turns out that molybdenum is actually quite soluble in seawater, and we have to look at that, that property, chemical property, to understand why it became uh, important in enzymes. And by the way, that also bears really on the uh, uh, scenario, you know, promoted by Mike Russell and Nick Lane and so on, that life began on the seafloor and it involved uh, these volcanic vents, probably not the hot volcanic vents like Vashtarheiser proposed, but the little cooler. Vector the Vechterheiser. Okay, I accept your pronunciation. And uh, it's these alkaline chimneys, which we see. And the fact that the uh, at the heart of some of the primitive enzymes of life are... Um, uh, groups of iron and sulfur, which are stereochemically very similar to some of the iron sulfate mineral sulfide minerals that are precipitated in these vents, and it's similarly for other uh, other um, elements like zinc and nickel and so on, which are essential for life. And uh, so this this is why I think that. Uh, and also for other reasons that Nick Lane really expounded very well in his last book, uh, that uh, uh, that this scenario is much more probable than the pro old version of the primordial, than the primordial soup. Oh, okay.